Welcome, welcome. My name is Stephen Newby, and I'm going to share with you today ideas. Ideas. We're going to have a creative conversation. We're going to use our Christian imagination around the idea of worship, theology of worship, theology of music, and theology of reconciliation. That's a lot of stuff. I hope to give you some tools and some maps, if you will, and some bridges so that you can take this home and begin to uh, explore for yourself. So let's open in prayer. We're going to read a few passages of scripture, and we're going to begin this journey again. Because once we accepted Christ as our Savior, we started this wonderful journey, so we get to begin again. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for what you're doing here. Lord, we pray that you will speak to our hearts, give us clarity, understanding, give us discernment, give us your wisdom. Lord, we pray that you would uh, fill us with your spirit. Lord, let our meditations, our conversations, our imaginations, all of those things that come out of us and come through us, Lord, let them be pleasing to you. We pray this in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. When you think about the idea of a theology of worship, what comes to your mind? Just quickly, just quick, quick, quick buzzwords. What comes to your mind? Theology of worship. Theology of worship. What comes to you? Holiness. Great. What else? Praise. What else? Thanksgiving, what else? Awe, joy, what else? Love, truth. So there are a lot of, a lot of wonderful words that just pop up, if you will, on our idea of theology of worship. And we have to make sure all these ideas are tethered and tied and married to scripture. So I wanna invite you, as you're defining your idea of theology of worship, go through Holy Writ go through scripture and, and, and tie those ideas with, with your imagination. See if your imagination is tethered to scripture and just about everything that you said here this morning. Wow, it's, we can find passages of scripture that point to these wonderful terms, these words. So, so we build a lexicon, we build, we build a theology of worship and we don't close the door on that. It's constantly being built and rebuilt and constructed. In John chapter four, where Jesus meets the woman at the well. Well, he's meeting the woman at the well. Say well. well okay, it's like, okay, this is gonna be interesting. There's a dialogue here in John four, and in John four, there are seven responses or engagement that, that Christ encounters with this woman. And the first encounter in John 4, 7, Jesus said to her, give me a drink. We can't worship until God gives us the We didn't start this relationship, God did. So when we gather together, God is, God is asking, give me a drink, have an encounter with me. When Adam and Eve, when they were in trouble in Genesis, it wasn't Adam that shouted, hey God, where are you? It was God that cried out, Adam, where are you? That's initiation. God always initiates. So in our theology of worship, just know that we didn't start this thing. God did. So now we want to think about a theology of reconciliation. In the Bible, in Colossians <clears throat> chapter 1, where it says, it speaks about the preeminence of Christ. Beginning at verse 15, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, 
visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. So there's again, the initiator, the creator. And because God creates, God wants us to be creative too and to use our imagination. Further down here in scripture, in verse 20, and through him, I'm sorry, verse 19, for in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, speaking about Christ, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. A healthy theology of reconciliation is tethered to this idea that Christ, the Father God, and the Holy Spirit have already initiated something that's taking place in the world. It's already done this thing, and we are ambassadors of reconciliation. So a healthy theology of reconciliation is realizing that God is interested in making everything right. Now, why a theology of reconciliation? Because reconciliation is part of this idea that, that when we worship God, we worship because of our relationship with God and we're reconciled to God. But we also must be reconciled with humanity and with creation. You can't separate the two. So a healthy theology of worship is constructed and built within a theology of reconciliation. Remember in Holy Writ, it says, uh, you know, you gotta get your stuff together. You better get your stuff together with your neighbor before you bring your offering to God. That's reconciliation. The final, uh, theology that we're going to look at before we dive in into this idea of worship and the reconciliation of all people and worshiping outside of the box and using a Christian imagination to worship is a theology of music. And we have this incredible book that's within this book that's called the book of Psalms. purely instructive how we, are to, how we are to manage this resource called music. Now, when we play music, listening to it doesn't necessarily mean that we are worshiping. Music is a tool. It is not an icon. It is not the driver that drives us to think holy and to think about the things of God. It's the Holy Spirit that draws us because the Holy Spirit is the initiator. Music is not an initiator. So perhaps for some of our uh, congregations as we're constructing our liturgies and our times of ingathering, we should consider not using music in a way that's going to warm people up. Ooh. <laughs> but music or, yeah, or it, yeah, ascending out is different. And you, and you see the sending out in, in John 4. You see it. You see Jesus is sending her out. Because she says, oh, oh, let me tell everybody about this guy that knows everything about me. And some of the guys are going, ooh. I'm part of her narrative. God sees everything. God takes the initiative. God sends us out. God has given us the gift of music. And God uses music to engage with us. It's God that engages with us. It's not the music. So when we focus on uh, uh, this idea of maybe using a particular style to to bring us into the end gathering or as a call to worship. Yes, that's what music is. Music is a signpost to a, for the call to worship. And some congregations is 
Oh, let us all go back to the old landmark. And that, that might be for your congregation. Another congregation might decide to... Oh, hear the bells are ringing. Oh, come. I heard bells this morning. I heard church bells this morning. Oh, did I heard God using the church bells this morning in this city as a call to worship. So music, a healthy theology of music ties into this idea. Oh, I think we've lost our connection. But ties us into this idea that God is calling us and God has given us this gift. So we should not worship the gift. We shouldn't put so much onus on the gift. Well, do we do that, Stephen? Well, I'm glad you asked that question. I think we do do, uh, do it quite a bit. Because we're interested in preferences. We're interested in styles. We're interested in musical genre. My remote is offline. I'm going to just cue us so maybe we can just go ahead and manually. Okay, we got something manually up there. In Psalm 21, verse 13, I think this is a healthy idea of how we manage music. Arise, O Lord, in your strength, and then we respond. We will sing and make music to praise your power. We're creating the image of God. God is a creator, and God commands us to be creative. So we create music. The power is not in the music. The power is in God. The strength is in God. So we use music to praise the power of God. Let's not give music power. So look here. Who's singing? Next slide. Next. Let's cue that. Yeah. God's people. God's creation. Look at that. To whom are we singing? We're singing to God. We're singing to each other. And what else? Does God sing to us? God instructs us. Christ intercedes for us. Jesus is Jewish, folks, okay, you know, here's the deal. They sing when they pray. And I imagine Jesus is singing when he's praying. That's my Christian imagination. It's very difficult to put Jesus in a box. Mary couldn't keep him in a manger. And the cross couldn't hold him. Death couldn't hold him. The grave couldn't hold him. We can't put Jesus in a box. We can't put what God is doing in the world in a box. We have to have a broader Christian imagination. Moving forward, in what ways do we find this music uh, useful? Well, here's a key verse. In Exodus 15, verses 1 through 21, and you can, you can look at this when you, uh, on your own. Moses and the Israelites sang this song to the Lord. I will sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. The horse and its rider he has hurled into the sea. That's a narrative. Next slide, please. For he is highly exalted. The horse and his rider, and he has hurled into the sea. So I, I have some exegetical uh, questions that I'm, I'm, I'm throwing out there. Look at these questions. How can we know that music is worthy, the music that we use is worthy of worship? I think you have to ask these questions. Are the words doctrinally sound? Is the text biblical? Does it stimulate spiritual thought? Does it properly instruct? Does it inspire high spiritual ideals? Does the music fit the text? Is it excellent? Does it fit the need? 
does it produce a wholesome response? Do harmful associations come to mind because the music was built, constructed, or composed by a particular composer? So see, one's testimony, one wit one's witness, uh, is tied into how we choose to deal with a piece of music. In Philippians 4, verse 8, it says, Finally, my brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence, if anything worthy of praise, let your mind dwell on these things. When we gather together in worship, our process of reconciliation, the music that we use, as Holy Writ, as Holy Scripture guides us, as Holy Spirit guides us, does it put our whole being in a wholesome place? Is the question. Perhaps too much of the heavy lifting in our liturgy is put upon the worship leader and the pastors. So when we come together, we should prepare ourselves in a way that we're just not coming to be fed, but we're coming to feed and to feast, to feed others and to feast upon God. Let everything be done through edification. Any questions so far? Any questions, any thoughts, any observations, any comments, any any thoughts, any questions or observations? Sure, I can do, yes, we can do that, yes. If they're gonna quote, get their groove on, end quote, with that particular genre, then I'm going to be grateful for them and I can have gratitude. So it's an attitude of humility that the, the pre someone else's preferences are more important than my own. And if you, one can find scripture tied into the music, then there's no excuse. You may not like the, de the deliverer, but you must accept the deliverables. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah, it's, it's on. Check one, two. Oh, yeah. Give me a little bit. So I just was thinking that when you get up in the morning on Sunday morning and you're kind of tired and you're rushing around and you're out here, I think there is a tendency to look at the music that's going to warm us up. Oh, absolutely. You know, I used to belong to a very liturgical church where they really required or suggested strongly that we pray. Absolutely. Yes. So the Holy Spirit is stirring up in us. And uh, th th that, what is your name? Ruth, thank you very much. I think that that's very insightful. See, that's what I'm talking about, everyone doing the, the heavy lifting. Um, I do think that we need to be in prayer, both individually and corporately, that we should be very intentional and strategic with our prayer times. Uh, what, would be, what would be great uh, for, for our congregation, because sometimes we suffer with the very same thing, is that people will come to the gathering with an attitude of prayer in the first place. So that they are praying, we are praying individually. And then there's a time uh, maybe in different rooms in, in this, uh, on site on the campus, or maybe even at times in the service where, where people can enter with a particular type of reverence. Um, I think a variety of litur liturgical responses and forms of engagement are critical because there are so many preferences and so many styles uh, that people prefer. But everyone can read scripture. Everyone can pray. 
And there's something powerful about a simple melody. I was sharing with Sarah the, the power of the melody this weekend. And join me in this song. Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is. Then the response. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. For the Bible tells me so. Now let's sing, Yes, Jesus loves us. And I'm going to show you what happens when we begin to sing that. Ready, Anne? He yes, Jesus loves us. He yes, Jesus loves us. The Bible tells us. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's hard to sing that uh, when you have a little bitterness against your brother or sister. It's kind of hard to sing that when, uh, you know, your marriage has been a little rocky. It's kind of hard to sing that when, when parents and kids aren't getting along. But we are ambassadors of reconciliation. So everything should be done with edification, as in 1 Corinthians 4, 14, 26. Um, for our discussion, <clears throat> let's look at the next slide. I have three questions. I want you to think on these questions for about 30 seconds and choose any question to respond to. So these three questions, yes, the next slide. Yeah, good. All right, the other one with the three questions. Thank you. What is a good song? What is good theology that's tied to a song? And the last question is, what is good worship? I want you to think about these things. Think about them. What do you define as a good song? And we're going to address, uh, Priscilla, your question there. When we popular hymns in North American hymnody is the piece Amazing Grace. There have been many arrangements of this particular piece. Why is this song so incredible? Yes, it, it, shows, it shows the true, the true self when, when Holy Spirit is not controlling us. What, what, what else? else? What else? What else? But then it does the opposite. It shows how wretched we are and how amazing, and how amazing, God, amazing God is. Amazing God is. So amazing. It does. It does. Yeah. And what, what else? These are excellent responses. There's so much hope. 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 Would you say that this Amazing Grace is a good song? Yeah, yeah. How long has it been in the canon, the literature? For a long time. It's been there for a long time. A lot of songs we sing uh, won't make it that long. But there's wonderful depth of theology pressed into the text. So how do you know a good song? Is something that people have been singing for 200 years. Another thing is that it's tethered to scripture and it's got good theology. All right. What is good theology? Tethered to, 
tells you the truth about God. Yep, it's focused on God. I'm, uh, I would also say that there's a Trinitarianism that's pressed into the good theology. What would you describe as good worship? Casey, what do you think good worship is? All right. Do you know this song? Light of the world, light of the world, you step down into darkness, open my eyes, let me see. And the chorus, so here I am to, here I am to. All right, it has to, another, another signpost of a good song has to be known. It's all right to sing songs that are older than 10 years old, older than 20 years old. Uh, that that's, makes a good song and a song with good, the, I think Here I Am to Worship is a great song. Why? Because I think it's singable. The range is, is not too vast. I think you can put it in a great key. I think it's intergenerational. It makes you to go deep because like the prophet Isaiah, I see the Lord seated upon the throne. Here I am, Lord, send me. Here I am to worship. So I think good songs signal the biblical text. And there are certain words in songs that work intertextually with scripture. The whole idea of I am the great I am, or here I am, it points to scripture. Lyrics are important. So you have to do the heavy lifting and do the homework and examine the text. Does the text remind me of scripture? Bow down. straight to bow down to to really deeply give of oneself to God it's hard to do that in our North American culture because things are moving so quickly so we have to slow down uh, a sociologist by the name of Robert Beckford in a book entitled Jesus Dub theology music and social change says he defines worship as this It's important to state that good worship in quotes can be defined as a collective sense that the spirit has moved and the worship is alive, experiencing the spirit in a holistic way in mind and body through the singing of hymns and songs or in testimony and sermon validates true worship. And in John 4, Jesus laid it out, said, you know, the father's looking for worshipers that are going to worship God in spirit and in truth. In the book of Exodus 33, Moses has this encounter with the Lord where God says, you can't see my face. You can see my back, but you can't see my face. Beginning at 17, the Lord said to Moses, this very thing... <clears throat> that you have spoken I will do for you have found favor in my sight and I, and I know you by name. Moses said, please show me your glory. This is a deep relationship. And God said, and he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy but he said 
you cannot see my face for man shall not see me and live. And the Lord said, behold, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock. All right, this is Trinitarianism. We're, 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 we're seeing the fullness of God present. The rock. And while my glory passes by, I will cover you. I'll put you in a cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I've passed by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. God is covering us with his spirit. God presses us into healthy situations, hard situations, with Jesus to mold us and to make us into the image of God. And perhaps our liturgies, our gatherings, should not necessarily be comfortable places all the time. Now, that's radical. Any response to that? Any thought on that? How much time do we have? About 10, 15 minutes. There's a lot of material here, and I don't, I'm, you're, you're going to be able to hold on to this. But the idea that God wants to reconcile us. And the last slide, can we pull the last slide there? I think when we gather together, yeah, just the very last slide. When we gather together, God expects us to give up something. There's an old, old gospel song. When I came to church, I woke up with my mind, stayed on Jesus. And I came to church to lose my mind and to gain, to grasp the mind of Christ. So a lot of what we struggle with in our liturgies is this idea of what we feel like is going to work for us. We have to submit our preferences as an act of humility as unto the Lord Jesus Christ. Be humble like Christ, acknowledge our biases, and in a corporate faith community worship service setting, knowing that our preferences, our personal tastes are not an imperative for personal expression of worship to God. God is interested in our character development more than our devout patterns of worship. Songs communicate. Styles and genre and performance practice are about the people, but worship is about God. And if we can remember this and allow these ideas to work as scalpelly while we're designing our worship services. And I believe that worship services should not just be designed by the worship leaders, worship pastors. I think the congregation needs to get involved. What, what, what's your name again? Ruth. Ruth, stand up for a minute, Ruth. Stand up for a minute. Can you, can, are you able to come here for a minute? Okay. I want you to do this with me. Okay. <laughs> I know it was the blood. I know it was the blood. Now, now, now what's happening right there? We're loosening up. We're dancing. We're moving. And I, my, my whole body is in gear. And I'm looking at her, and she's looking at me. But we're singing about Jesus, and we're beginning to celebrate in another kind of way. Because the whole being is involved. You know, one thing I'd like to see is that people would jump up with a spontaneous testimony. And that can happen. Well, well here's... Our, some of the challenges that are set before us, not only in faith community here, it's everywhere. Let me help you back. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. I believe that we should come to a place, and I'll close with this, that we need to be around the table intergenerationally. 
multi-ethnically. And say there are how many people in this faith community? 500. So there's a representative from each family that's part of the liturgical team. So that means you have a rotation. You have how many Sundays in a year? You have a rotation of maybe, you know, 20, 20 teams. And maybe 30 people are on those teams. And you're working on the liturgy for a particular Sunday three, four months in advance. And there's going to be a variety emerging and people are investing in the service. So instead of asking or saying we should do this, we should do that, it do it. We have to do it. And it starts in our homes. Practice worshiping in your home, inviting people over and designing the liturgy in our homes first. And what's going to happen? It's going to spread. That fire is going to spread. But before that fire spreads to your home church, it's going to spread to your neighborhood. It's going to spread to your school. All of a sudden, the city is going to change again because God is using you as ambassadors for reconciliation. And it begins with God taking the initiative. God saying, Ocean Hills, what are you going to do now? And the response probably is, Lord, here I am. Send me. Let's close in prayer. Gracious eternal God, thank you for this time. You are interested in the reconciliation of all people. And Lord, we pray that you will use us in a mighty way. That Lord, that we would design worship services in our homes and for our neighborhoods. That we would have worship services, yes, in our homes. There'll be 30, 40, 50 people just gathered. And Lord, we would design liturgies and prayers and write litanies and compose new music. And Lord, those young people that are 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, and 21, they would be involved in the liturgies as well. They would bring these new ideas to the table. And Lord, we pray that you would use us to be ambassadors of reconciliation as an act of worship unto you. Lord, we pray that you will continue to fill us with your spirit. Lord, we can't see your face, but we know you're present, and we know you've got our back. Lord, we will hide in the cleft of the rock under the power of the Holy Spirit we will sit with you, Jesus. So, Lord, we worship you. Now, as we continue to prepare for our service, Lord, let us lose our minds and have the mind of Christ. In Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Let's give. Oh, yes, 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 absolutely. Well, the leading, I pray. I, yes, amen, amen. Father, we thank you. God bless you. God bless you. So.